Thank you. Uh, so a reminder of the code of conduct as well. If you're not familiar with the Turing Way code of conduct, perhaps you're a guest with us today. It's lovely to see you for the first time. Um, head on over to the code of conduct. And um, it's worth noticing that there are specific routes. If there's anything that you want to report, you can get in touch with Malvika or Kirsty, or um, there are other routes to report any issues with code of conduct. And I think the basic stance is be kind to each other, be nice to each other, be respectful of each other's differences, and also be welcoming of each other's differences as well. Anything that I'm missing, Malvika, I think we're good. And there's a few other people have entered the room as well. So one more reminder that there's a etherpad shared in the chat. If you want to jump in, introduce yourself with your name and pronouns if you'd like to, and where you're joining us from. Right. Housekeeping done in two minutes. Great. Thank you so much. So my name's Cassandra. Um, you can call me Cass. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman in my late-ish 30s. I've got kind of grey-ish, bluish hair. I'm wearing a black top today. And um, I am uh, thrilled to be joining you for this event where I get to speak to two people that I admire very greatly and who have been so instrumental in the work that I'm doing and the work that I uh, I'm very proud to be doing. Um, and we're just going to have a chat about uh, a bit of the history of the Turing Way, where it's come from, where it's going to, maybe where we see uh, potential uh, opportunities for improving the world and society and the, the sector that we work in as researchers of, in different uh, ways. And um, importantly as well, make space for you all to have a chat with us as well. Um, many of you probably don't know me, that's fine. Don't chat with me, chat with Malvika and Kirsty, and I'll just be the, the conduit to facilitate it. And that's fun for me too. Um, one more thing I wanted to say um, is at the end of the etherpad, um, as you, you may know, this is the first fireside chat that um, her Turing Way have set up, which I think is gonna be fun but we would love your feedback about who could be uh, invited for future fireside discussions and um, also a bit of your feedback about what works for this event. So right at the very end of the document, we'll make time to do this at the end of the call. Um, I'd like to have to think about uh, what has worked during this call, what didn't work, what would you change, what surprised you, and then the other nice things that you want to say or not so nice things you want to say if all feedback is useful. So I think we'll get into it if that's okay. Um, so I would like to start with Malvika, if that's okay, because I hear from Kirsty a fair amount at conferences. I've been following her, her around like a lost puppy for a couple of years now. And I hear Kirsty speak, but I haven't heard Malvika speak about how you came to the Turing Way. So perhaps you want to say a little bit about how you found the Turing Way and, and what it means for you as a project. Hi everyone, I'm Malvika Shurun. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, visually, I am an Indian woman in my mid thirties. I'm wearing my Indian silver today uh, and I have black hair, I'm wearing headphones. I'm joining from my hometown uh, where I am for a month. So uh, about the Turing Way, I have been working in the intersection of community inclusiveness and computational uh, skills. And I am very much interested in enabling training for early career researchers and mentoring them into open science. And in that effort, I received a fellowship in 2019 from Software Sustainability Institute. And it required that each fellow look for a mentor who they would like to work with in that year. And that's when I contacted Kirsty. I had seen her work online and like you get Cass, I had seen her tweet. I had seen her write about things in most of the communities that I was part of. And it really looked like that we work in really similar space. I just hadn't uh, collaborated with her at the time. And she said, yes, luckily to be my mentor at the time. And the first time I went in to talk about the project, uh, Kirsty said, well, it sounds like the thing that I'm actually building. And she introduced me to the Turing Way uh, where we, the idea was to actually do that, to, to enable not just early career researcher, but people who are new to data science to get into data science. 
Um, and basically, at the end of the meeting, Kirsty offered me to come to work with her in the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, so that was very lucky. And I did move. I was uh, working in bioinformatics at the time, but in the community uh, building again. And in the Turing way so far, uh, what has glued me is basically continue with my passion of working in that particular intersection of inclusion, diversity, computation, and also enabling people to, to participate in a very equitable manner, not just something that we are facilitating, but we are talking to them, learning about what they are working on and how we can highlight their work. So the Turing way is literally bringing people in enabling them to share what they know from their communities. So that's really my pathway to the Turing Way. And I'm uh, always still excited to work uh, in the project with all the wonderful people. A lot of them have joined today. So very lovely to see them. I love that. Um, that so I don't want to assume that everyone here knows what the Turing Way is, but from Malvika's introduction, it's it's something which exists in the intersection between inclusivity, bioinformatics, community, all of the great things. So perhaps following from that, Kirsty, do you want to give your introduction to what the, the Turing Way is and what it means for you? Yeah, do you want me to fold in the sort of the origin story of the Turing Way as well? I yeah, think. let's do it, let's yeah. do it. A, a lot of, I've told so many times that I forget that there are more and more people to, to meet and to, and to tell. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Kirsty Whitaker, my pronouns are she, her, hers, um, and I am, I, I'm also a, a woman in my late 30s, uh, I'm white, I'm wearing, I have longish, although it just got cut recently, blonde hair tied up in a ponytail, and I have um, dark black uh, rimmed glasses, uh, and I'm in my, in my bedroom at home with uh, some embroidery that my, that my grand, my, my um, grandmother who's passed away uh, stitched when I was very, very young. So I have a very strong memory of seeing um, this, this piece every time I went over to her house when I was little. Um, so I joined the Alan Turing Institute in, uh, in, in January 2017. And I actually was sitting there, although I hadn't actually started my fellowship. So I had a research fellowship at the Turing Institute uh, that actually started in the summer because I had been very successful in 2016 of being awarded two fellowships very close. The deadlines were three days apart from each other. And I was awarded a Mozilla Fellow for Science uh, fellowship, which started quite quickly in 2016 and ran for 10 months. And then I also was very um, fortunate to receive a five-year research fellowship at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. And in both of those applications, what I had written about was the importance of reproducibility and the importance of being able to build on the published literature. So my sort of background is that I have a PhD in neuroscience. I worked as a postdoc in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Cambridge, doing very similar stuff, putting teenagers in MRI machines and looking at their brains. Um, and one of the things that I was very kind of frustrated by and, and ultimately motivated by is the fact that if you found a result that did not align with previously published work, it was very, very difficult to kind of communicate and share that result. And so what I was, what I sort of was spending a lot of time thinking about is how much work goes in the metaphorical file drawer. So how much work early career researchers do that either shows a null result, that they can't find the same signal um, as others have, have in their published literature, or they actually find something that's slightly different, but difficult to sort of understand why, and how much of that work, just those stories just don't get told. So when I arrived um, at the Turing Institute, I came with a mission to make all research at the Turing Institute reproducible. And I thought that coming from a background in, in neuroscience, it's sort of very, my area was very overlapping with cognitive psychology. I was, I was very sort of confident that turning up at the Turing Institute, everything would be so much easier because one of the very hard parts about reproducibility in, um, in neuroscience or psychology 
is people often haven't been taught how to write code or how to use version control um, or even sort of some of the, some data management practices in their their education so far. So some people will learn it, but but in many cases they're doing it. Well, in almost all cases, they're kind of doing it off their own backs. And so if you don't know to go and learn those skills, then of course it, it's very difficult to kind of implement them in your work. So I thought data science, right? Everyone's going to be these amazing coders. Everyone's going to be working at like the highest possible levels of transparency and uh, and reproducibility, and we're going to kind of be an institute that demonstrates, you know, everyone can do it. And I'd like to share with you all that I was very wrong about that assumption. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, please tell me they're not as was, amazing that as that. Not, that was not, in fact, the case. And what's really interesting, what was a really interesting reflection is that yes, there are a lot of people who work at the Turing Institute who, who do know how to program. Many of them even like develop programming languages. They, they're very, very sort of, you know, they have excellent mathematics and statistical skills, but that's quite a separable skill from thinking about how your work will be understood by others, potentially reused by others, and thinking about the whole life cycle of everything that you do as part of the project. So something that's very, very common in sort of computer science, machine learning, is that there will be code shared for the specific algorithm part. So people are often not great at remembering that there's all of this other work that you do to sort of prepare the data in the first place. And then there's some amount of work that you do to present um, your results. And so we, what I sort of wanted was this, you know, take the original input data, get the same results out, the same figures, the same tables. Um, and I would say some, but definitely not all, in fact, probably less than half of the researchers at the Turing kind of do that all the way through. So I was there and, and I built allies, particularly in the research engineering group at the Turing Institute, who are made up of research data scientists and research software engineers who are very, very passionate and very, very aligned with the same sort of change that, that I was very keen to, to make in the world and kind of project into the world. And we sort of tried to do a couple of, of proto projects. We tried to see if we could reproduce some, some findings. And it was very hard. And really what I sort of ended up reflecting on is mostly because people don't even know that there are things that they don't know. So fast forward to 2018, and the Turing Institute received um, a £40 million uh, grant investment from a strategic priority fund at, uh, from the government investigating the uses of AI to support the, uh, science and government. And we have a theme uh, that now I lead, but I didn't, I didn't used to, um, called Tools, Practices and Systems, which is our cross-cutting theme. And there was some budget in there. And in the first year of this five-year uh, grant, because there was something else that was going on in, in 2018, which related to um, the UK deciding to leave the European Union, the government were very keen to announce that they had made this investment in AI for science and government, but also were very busy. And so the deadline for actually announcing that it was happening kept being pushed, kept being pushed, kept being pushed. But we had to spend the first fifth of the money in the first year. So we were, we were asked to come up with um, projects that could demonstrate value, that could, be, make, could make a positive difference, could start very quickly and could be done by, by March, could be showing impact by March uh, 2019. And I went and I gave a talk in Berlin. It was brilliant. It was a lovely talk to um, some, uh, to a student conference. And then I went to a delightful coffee shop and it turned out that there was no laptops allowed. And so I sat there with my colorful pens and my notepad and I drew out some sort of, you know, mind cloud kind of thing three different ideas for projects that I thought would, were, were, would sort of fit in that space, projects that were going to be related to open infrastructure, related to open science or open source tooling, and could sort of show and demonstrate some values, some value to others straight away. 
And two of those projects were chosen, although we combined them into one project and that project was the Turing Way. Cass, I think I'm gonna pause because I've given like a huge amount of history, but I haven't got onto all of the other parts of the, where the Turing Way is going to go and things like that. But shall I, shall I let Malvika join in with some points? That's, I mean, I've not heard the origin story. The story I've heard is one that activates me that goes, isn't science a mess? And we go, yes, it is. And we try and do something about it. So I think it's um, as like a human and a researcher, it's really interesting to hear like the serendipity in some of those things and go, oh, okay, so now we need to spend this money quickly. How can we spend this money quickly? And that something which now looks like this, like a beast of the Turing way, started off with colored pens and what a Berlin thing to no laptops. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and it also was, I think one of the other things to note is it was heavily inspired by the, the fantastic training and mentorship that I received during my, um, my fellowship with Mozilla. So that was, I actually applied for Mozilla fellowship, fellowship twice. And the first year I was got all the way through to the final rounds, but I wasn't selected. But I was invited to join the very first working open workshop that was also held in, in Berlin. They have a great office uh, <laughs> for Mozilla in Berlin. And that was where I sort of learned about not just plunking your code up on GitHub and having people be able to kind of click, click to find it, but actually what it means to make truly participatory decisions. And also, I don't, I, oh, it wasn't the Working Open Workshop where I did my first pull request, but it was MozFest a couple of months beforehand where I did my first pull request and it was a game of bingo that they ran. And we had to all put in a, put in a pull request whenever we had a number that crossed off our board. And, that was the very, very first time that I had actually understood what was going on with the sort of um, forking and branches and reviews kind of aspect of GitHub. And one of, one of my great passions, and I think one of the things that we've, we've tried to bake very strongly into the Turing way, is we build it on GitHub because although we do care about the book, and we have spectacular amounts of content and it's, it's amazing how much our contributors have sort of put, brought, brought together to help and assist others to, to learn and to do science better, more easily for them. What I have always really wanted is for people to join the Turing Way community and gain two specific things. One is I want them to be able to work on GitHub. I want them to get over that terrifying activation barrier of what is all of this jargon? What do these buttons mean? Why are there like seven different ways of doing the exact same thing? Because you do get over that, that sort of scary um, hump, that knowledge kind of challenge. It opens tons and tons of opportunities. And then the other thing that I want people to come to the Turing Way I'm, I'm trying to avoid saying leaving because I don't want them to leave, but you know, I want them to take with them into their work um, a feeling that it's okay to show something that's not perfect and everybody can help to improve something. That there is no, there is no sort of siloed tower of people who know all the answers and then everyone else sort of like climbing their way to the top of it to try and learn it. There are multiple towers, there are hillocks absolutely everywhere. And there is something I think so powerful about seeing people try, even if they don't succeed um, at every point. And then the sort of the attitude and the culture of coming in and saying, I can help you. So instead of just criticizing, you can find a bug, you can find an error, you can find a part that doesn't make sense. But then what we do is we really scaffold to support ideally that person, but maybe someone else to come in and help. Because I think that culture, if, we, if everyone can sort of relate to that and can find some confidence inside of themselves, I think that is our pathway to really changing, changing the whole of culture of science. 
That's wonderful. And um, I know Malvika has some history with Mozilla as well. And um, if you don't know, Malvika, uh, with some other folks, runs a open life sciences training uh, course, uh, life intervention, perhaps. And the same messages came through really strongly on that course that it's about one GitHub is not scary. Yes, it is scary, but it doesn't need to be once you've got some kind of understanding of how things work. And I want to know, Malvika, were you one of the people that already knew GitHub or were you like the rest of us a bit kind of intimidated by it? And now you're uh, singing the praises or? I had to learn GitHub during my PhD, but very unfortunately, when I was trying to publish the, the software that I had been working on for three years. So I learned very quickly that it was a mistake to wait that long because I had to accumulate all the work of uh, building documentation, getting the review done at the same time, whereas GitHub should be something that we do from the day zero, where you're doing things very incrementally and the win-win that you would have by putting things online is that getting more eyes on the work that you're doing so you can actually get your process as good as possible. And any, anyhow, actually, when I got my paper reviewed, my reviewers were working with me on GitHub, and that was really, really fantastic. So I could see when they logged in, when they cloned my repository, I was very excited, but they also helped me to improve a lot of things. So I came with that really huge excitement about why GitHub is so important. At the same time, when I was working with the Carpentries uh, as a volunteer, Carpentries is another organization that teaches computational skills to um, novice learners. And as a part of our training, we're supposed to create a pull request. And the pull request could be just fix a typo or do whatever. I think they were trying also to help us get over that barrier of contributing to a public repository. So we can all work in our own repository because we feel a strong sense of ownership. But working on a public repository is where we feel like, oh, I don't want to appear wrong. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to get judged. So all these fear happen when you're working with like other hundreds of people. And I think GitHub is definitely for the Turing way, that space to make sure that we are demonstrating a community where people are welcoming, people give kind reviews, people actually help you get over some errors and mistakes you've had. At the same time, reviewers also get the same credit as a contributor. So reviewing is a mentorship process, in my opinion, in, in our opinion, I would say. And uh, yeah, I think GitHub is not something that we're trying to promote as the only substitute. Uh, you have GitLab, you have Bitbucket, but it just happened we are on GitHub. And if you're terrified, um, we will be running a workshop on the 3rd of November and I'll add more information for, about that. So um, yeah, GitHub is that, but I also wanted to add one more thing that I, along with all, all these wonderful things that Kirsty just shared about, you know, getting people over that barrier of technical uh, tools that we are using. I think what we need to recognize that in, I heard some wonderful dogs. Uh, what we need to recognize is that data science is about people. And if we are gonna deliver a solution in data science, we need to understand where these people come from, what kind of environment they're working in or actually works for them. So we don't want the Turing way to become a recommendation, which is telling people what to do, but to become a resource that people build for their own communities. And we have wonderful example about that as well, that, that the project is open source and hence it is your work. You can use it in whatever way you want for the community that you're part of. So yeah, people aspect is something that I truly care about. And that's why I really want to emphasize that the Turing way is as much about data science and technology as much it is about the people who are working there. Awesome. Kirsty has a very polite hand up there. Yeah, I wanted to just, just jump in because actually both of the things Malvika said, I um I think are, are really a point's really beautifully made. And I on the on the um name of the Turing way, that was something that I was going to sort of fold in with the history. So there's a, a principal data scientist working inside of the research engineering group called James Geddes, 
And he has been at the Turing Institute since, uh, for, since really the very, very beginning, um, which was only in 2016. It's a very young institute. Um, and he really wanted the Turing to be more opinionated, to sort of, he, he had this idea, he had it from very early on. And I used to talk with him in, in the kitchen about it. He was like, we should write a book. We should call it the Turing way. Now, his idea was, was sort of more aligned along um, how people should be modeling and kind of some of the decisions that they should be making with, with how they sort of work with data. But actually, when I was sitting in that coffee shop in, in Berlin and brainstorming these ideas, I felt that this guide that originally started as a guide for reproducibility and then sort of, you know, expanded, um, I felt that it was kind of the close, it was close to his idea. It was aligning with, with kind of the, the core of his, his sort of perspective of saying, we should, we should be more confident. As an institute, we should be sort of putting ourselves out there and letting people know what we think good practices are. And then, you know, the, the compliment to that is and helping them <laughs> and helping them and listening to them and incorporating all of those different ideas. So I wanted to just sort of shout out that, that actually the name was one that I stole from James Geddes. I did ask permission before I stole it. Um, so he is a contributor to the book from the very, very sort of in initial moments of its conception. But I wanted to just acknowledge that it was really Malvika who kind of did a, did a really deep dive into thinking about the name and, and thinking about how, because I knew that it was a problem that it can be read as, this is what the Turing tells you to do. And I knew that was a problem and I knew that wasn't sort of where I was going, but we kind of had this name and, and it, was, it was Malvika that really did the sort of deep thinking around saying, well, what if it was a pathway? What, it, what if it was a journey? What if it was a, a, a route that we all go along together and we lay it out together in front of us? And that means that we, we don't have to have all of the answers as we start and we can change our minds as we go along and we can incorporate more information as we go. And, and I think that's a really, that's a really beautiful um, interpretation and understanding of the name. And it's really aligned with the original, with the original spirit. It was never supposed to be a directive of a, of a resource. And then the other thing I wanted to just highlight around this GitHub point, because, because Malvika said, and she's absolutely right. We're not, you know, we're not paid by GitHub. We don't, we don't get like extra little swag, you know, in the evenings uh, to, to kind of promote GitHub. The, it's the flow and the, the ways of working that's important. And I wanted to link that specifically to the fact that it is um, asynchronous and decentralized. So for me, that's a really important aspect for including people more broadly. So I so wanted to link the sort of commitment to helping you understand the jargon of Git and branching and pull requests and reviews to thinking about who can participate in a project, what time do they have to participate in a project, what time zone, what part of the world um, are they living in, and how can they join in those conversations if, for example, you know, we're here on a Friday just after lunch for folks in the UK, um, what if they weren't available at the time? How could we help them to, to still be part of creating the Turing way? And I think the, the philosophy of a Git flow is, is really embedding that kind of inclusion for decentralized and asynchronous working. Um, and that's that's actually the most important part of why we want to get people over that technical technical jump. I think another like thing that really struck me when I first so I came to a book dash in 2018, I think it was, and this was at a time when I was like just learning about open science, and I was the hungriest little researcher doing every open science thing I could, and I was. This was the first time that I'd seen GitHub used for something other than code. And all of a sudden that opened up the possibility of um, maybe I don't have to be this amazing programmer. I'm like a neuroscience background. I've done a bit of self-taught self programming like many people. 
Um, but the idea of using GitHub for documentation has been revolutionary in the way that I promote it because people aren't scared of documentation. So I work with uh, clinicians and um, radiographers and all kinds of different folks who they understand what it is to have a, a document that is in draft. And we accept that if it's in draft, there may be errors and someone can point it out and here's how to fix it. And I, the point Malvika made as well about it's not just and Kirsty, it's not just saying here's the error. It's like here's the error, and I'm just gonna just gonna clean that up for you. How's that? Is that okay? Does that take a bit of the weight off you? And that kind of it goes full circle back to the the file draw issue, Kirsty, about um, the values that we have instilled in us as 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 like researchers and things is that. The only thing that you let the public see is your very perfect self because someone's going to ask you a question and pick your hole, pick the holes and pull on the threads. And that's not healthy. You know, it's led to uh, a fear and bullying and file draw. All of this research, you know, if I think about the projects that have gone wrong in ways that have then been shelved and the money that's been spent on that and the waste that's gone into that. So I think it's this really lovely um, way of giving people the confidence to make mistakes in public and accept that we are humans and we do make mistakes and here's the way of correcting it. And why don't we all contribute to correcting it as well? Great stuff. Yeah, if any uh, anyone that see, uh, is in a place where I'm in right now, I'm doing the same lessons that Kirsty and Malvika instilled in me when I'm like is there this thing on the Turing way and Malvika will tweet me back and go no there isn't Cass why don't you add that as an issue that's a great idea why don't you put it and now I do the same to folks that I work with I'm like oh why don't you just add that as an issue on our repository so it's um it's a it's a very powerful tool to help people engage with something that they think might be scary but it's incredibly useful for doing all the good reproducibility stuff as well. And then there was a couple of um, comments about uh, gamification of, of um, GitHub. Yes, all the games, make it fun, make it accessible. So we are like about sort of halfway through and there's one question in the Q&A. So we'll jump to that question now if that's okay. And then we can, while people are stewing, we can think a bit more and then um, think about other aspects. Like I'm particularly interested to dig into the community side of it as well. So the question is, if you were to start your journey with the Turing Way TTW now, what, if anything, would you do differently? I don't know if either of you want to take that. Um, I, I've occasionally got this question and I, like, I honestly wouldn't do a single thing different. <laughs> I wouldn't do a single thing different. And it's because it's because the journey has always been the point. I know that, and I, I wanna be just really clear, that is not my like standard Zen answer in all projects. There are, there are you could ask me about other projects and I'd be like, oh, I have regrets. I have so many, I would do this differently. I would do this differently, I would do this differently. But truly, truly for the Turing way, it was conceived as being radically open it was all, it always had this, this sort of dedication to just always changing, always moving as we went along. Um, you know, we had like one moment where, so what we had been, there's like a moment where we had been putting, um, so we keep copies of uh, slide presentations in the repository. So we've been keeping track of that. And there was a moment, I think, or maybe five months in where we realized that we'd been putting in um, the PowerPoint files and the PowerPoint files are actually very, very large and they don't mesh very well with version control because they're binary files. Same with you know, Word documents or Excel documents. And so actually our GitHub repository was gigantic. Like it was like far, far too big for you know, what it was supposed to be. And so um, we had a, a sort of, um, in person working, this was would have been back in 2019. We we had to sort of have a bit of a big fix, and there's a couple of files in there in the in the history. Uh, we did have to do a bit of a sort of mix around with the history to to remove some of those giant files. And 
yeah, you know, there's a couple of like that's probably our most like technical example of being like shouldn't have really put in like a bunch of massive files, Kirsty. Um, but I still think I still feel like how would we know? How were we supposed to know that that was going to be a problem? Um, yeah, Malvika, would you do anything differently? I feel like I'm just the cheesiest human on the planet. Of like everything's a lesson, man. Everything's part of the journey everything but then I have I would have done lots of things differently only if I had the experience that I have through the Turing way so uh, one of the things that I would do differently if you would notice we haven't made consistent releases of versions of the Turing way and the reason is it's quite crippling to sit down with the list of authors and if you go to the repository we are nearly 300 people and decide what do you consider authorship and what you don't consider authorship are all contributors author? If everyone's author, are we undermining the huge amount of work act, uh, chapter authors do? And very recently, I was chatting about that with Emma Karun, who was thinking about authorship a lot in another project that she works on with Kirsty. And she said, why don't we just release and not write author's name and say the Turing Way community and add the author list as a separate file or add it somewhere else? that would actually make the process of releasing much faster. Then I don't have to sit down every time that I want to release with like growing number of authors. And I thought, yeah, you know, if I, if that's something that we have been doing that the Turing Way community is the first author, but we also were very adamant on adding other authors name. So I think I would have done that differently because I, I feel that the versions are quite important and the history of how we have grown is very important, which luckily we can still do with the version control that we have. So that's one thing. Another is actually a, a conversation with Sophia Bachelor, who's all, also joining the call. She's a PhD student and we were talking about collaboration uh, with a group of people. And she said that we see collaboration very differently when we are in different stages of research. I see collaboration as I'm here, tell me about the project. I'm gonna find out where I work the best. I'm gonna find people who would work really well with the things that I'm working on. And I'm gonna be super proactive and you know, just, just do whatever I can. Whereas people who've not previously collaborated in open science projects, they come with the idea that they'll be told what to do. And it's not a wrong attitude to have because what else would they expect? They are working constantly under supervisors, they are expected to follow what supervisors are saying, and it's not wrong for them to expect that the similar environment will be created in different projects. And that really made me think that, yeah, maybe I am not targeting a part of audience that we really want to engage just because they want to be part of the Turing Way as, as contributor, but they don't really know where to start. They're a bit lost. And I feel partially responsible for that so I, I wish I could go back and change that no one's going to hold you responsible Malvika it's the journey it's not the destination so I mean that does kind of um bring us on to like the formal community aspect and the community work that the Turing Way does and this is kind of the, the issue of onboarding so what we want to do and what you want to achieve with the Turing Way is to kind of educate as many people as possible uh, involve them, let them experience the process. But you have to go from the stage of they don't know anything about the project, they maybe don't know anything about open science or they maybe have ideas, and you have to get them into that first kind of interaction with the project. Can you say anything about how you do that and, and then how you kind of want to help people progress through and become more experienced contributors? So I can take that onboarding question um, from my perspective. So some of the onboarding have been mostly, so I'm gonna actually use another name, Esther Plomp, also on the call. Uh, Esther had one day joined Collaboration Cafe that I was hosting. And Esther was somewhere in her research travel and sitting in a hotel and she decided to join me in one evening because she wanted to know a bit more about the Turing Way. And motivated by that interaction, she joined the Book Dash event that cast that you were attending. And the Book Dash is a bit more intense, right? That people work uh, over us. So uh, now it's one week, but back in the days when we were meeting in person, it was one and a half days. And they meet, they 
decide what they're going to work on, they collaborate with others, and that collaboration isn't ever going to finish, right? You can never finish writing something. You're going to carry that collaboration outside that event. And once you've done that, once let's say you wrote something and something all got published, it gives a huge sense of accomplishment as well as attachment of identity of what you have done. Um, and after that, if you see that people are using the work that you have published, you feel motivated to stay involved. But that's the story of Esther and people like Esther who are coming into the space and using that opportunity. Um, but we also recognize that there are a lot of people who are unfortunately not uh, able to attend those kind of uh, events for whatever reason, uh, time zone, disability, or you know, their new imposter syndrome is a huge thing too. So. For that, we started to host co-working calls, which is one hour um, working together. It could be any topic that you are either working on your own project and you would like to discuss that with us or something that you're working in the Turing way. And this is something I host every Monday. I had also tried an onboarding call as called as onboarding call. It didn't really work out. And I think it didn't work out mostly because people don't want to bother people by saying, oh, well, if I show up, someone has to sit down with me and show me things. So I just want to learn about something which isn't bothering others. But that's my perception. Maybe there are different reasons why people don't show up to onboarding calls. And uh, so the, I think the onboarding is really important because once you're here and once you recognize different places and different opportunities that you have and you're willing to talk to others, talk to not just me, there are so many core contributors that we have, um, you're likely to stick because they're all really, really incredible. And then how about the, the progression thing? Like I imagine there's a few people on, on the call that have been working on this for a long time and there's maybe a few people that are only just joining. So where, where can someone conceivably go once they've had their first interaction with you? So I, I want to just very quickly jump in here and then Malvika, I'm going to throw to you to, to actually answer the question. Um, because one of the things that, um, so I think there's two really interesting things around kind of onboarding and progression, which is that I think being mentored and supported by someone who's just one step ahead of you on the mountain of engagement is really powerful. So I have found myself, I get this feeling that I'm too intimidating to mental people who are coming up new. Now, I don't consider myself to be an intimidating person, but I have received that feedback from sort of a sufficient number of people that I think it probably must have some sort of grain of truth in there. So I have to take it as, as something to reflect on. And, and so sort of bringing, bringing people in becomes really hard for Malvika and me as we become sort of much further up the, this mountain of engagement. I don't know if, if someone can ping a, a link to the mountain of engagement in the chat, just in case anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about. It's sort of, as you imagine, it's a, a pathway up that kind of in terms of your involvement and responsibilities in a project. I also just wanted to highlight that we, we have a job posting for um, a new community manager for the Turing Way and that it closes on Sunday. So if you're here and you haven't yet got your application in, you, you, could, you could still apply. And, uh, and it's because we've, we've just very sort of successfully and very delightedly promoted Malvika to a, a permanent position at the Turing Institute as um, TDS Senior Researcher, so Tools, Practices and Systems Senior Researcher. And she will be, uh, she's, she's now the, the co-lead investigator with me for the Turing Way, and she'll be line managing the um, community manager when they come in. And the reason I say that is I want to just give some props to Malvika, I'm really, really delighted that she's gonna stay and stay with us at the, at the Turing Institute and obviously within the project. But also I think there's a real toughness around kind of, as the community grows, um, capacity, like you just need more, core support capacity in terms of um, mentoring and supporting people. So Malvika, I'm gonna hand over to you because you've done all, lots and lots of work thinking about kind of how we can grow the governance on that. And uh, I think that's a great way of hopefully linking up to it. Yeah, uh, so I'm gonna go a little bit, well, on topic, but off topic from the question. So 
communities, whatever communities you're building or you're a part of, at different stages, you would have different sort of governance. When Kirsty started this project, it was a, a networked approach where Kirsty connected with people who were working in her area uh, who were potentially interested in building the Turing Way. And now, based on that, these people who first connected in the Turing Way became the advocate for the Turing Way, and they brought more people in. So it was a, a, a second layer of network uh, that you can imagine. And right now, uh, we are in the stage where we are growing, and it's potentially not possible for us to continue doing the same approach that we were doing by one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction between me or Kirsty and uh, lots of people. But we are also in the stage where a lot of other people from the community have become leaders in the Turing way. They're doing and thinking and planning things that originally we couldn't have. So it's a, it's a time for us to actually evolve our governance to be, make it a little bit more decentralized. So. I wouldn't call it that it's totally centralized. It's still participatory driven. It's co-creation of whatever we're doing, but we, we want to go to a more decentralized approach where we can build our governance, uh, bring representative from the community to become part of a board who are helping us look through different aspects of the project, uh, which isn't possible for two or five people. We really need more people at the leadership positions. So governance is something that Kirsty and I have talked about for more than a year. And as soon as we have the community manager, this would be the first project that they would be working on. Um, we have actually a proposal already up on the GitHub. I'll pull that up and uh, post for you. So yeah, I hope that that answers because the progression at the moment looks like that you join the project, you become contributor, you become mentor, you become representative of the community, and then you become some sort of leader. And those leadership positions are not formally defined yet. And we want different people to actually come together to define these leadership positions. This shouldn't be the job that we do. We want people to come and say what is meaningful for them, what kind of platform works for them, what kind of platform actually gives them the authority that they need to push this project forward in their communities. So uh, please look out for this announcement whenever this comes out. So if somebody goes from being like this um, uh, ragtag bunch of folks who care about these issues, writing helpful guides and helping each other along the journey, to then you start talking about things like governance. And these are all like scary kind of concepts. And But I think... In the same way that uh, what you're trying to do with GitHub is to enable people to become comfortable with the idea that they don't know everything. Okay, it's okay that you don't know GitHub. It's okay that you'll make errors. I think the same can be said around governance. And this also kind of comes full circle back to issues about like data management and privacy and security. And these are things that we are a part of um, it's kind of like everything is political, like everything is governance, everything needs to be managed and you're doing it anyway. So here's just a way of kind of formalizing it and making it more transparent and making it easier for people to see how you are a part of the system and how the system is working to support you. Um, so I, I really uh, I had a useful conversation just yesterday where someone said, um, be agile with yourself right let's just accept that governance sounds scary but maybe it's not i was looking at massive finance statements it's like oh this is scary that's okay that it's scary let's just you know carry on with the process and and see where we go at the end um so i think and, and this has been really illuminating for me as well i think i'm going to start pronouncing it the turing way rather than the turing way the turing way something to emphasize that it's it's more of this process and a journey. And I think we need to do something like create like a, a, a montage of the last how many years to show what how this has evolved from Kirsty with the notebook and highlighters to governance and these, these more sort of scary issues. Um, so there's not too, there's some lovely chat in the questions about whether um, the Turing way is static and R-centric and it's kind of this data science heavy thing. So Kirstie's um, had some, some um, given some feedback in there. Do you want to mention any of that now or do I take it for the document, uh, leave it for the document, Kirstie? 
Cool, great. I think probably the document's fine, yeah. Thank you. Lovely. So then in the last few minutes, I know we've got a few of us have got hard stops. Here is a space for hot takes. I love a hot take. Given that we are all about the journey and uh, errors are okay and we're open to learning, is there anything, um, Kirsty? if it's okay, I'll, I'll leave Malvika to close it. So Kirsty, is there anything that you, uh, is the elephant in the room for you in, in either the Turing way or in the, the kind of the, the um, industry that we're working in, the sector that we work in perhaps? I guess one of the things that we haven't really touched on in this chat, and it, it, it's always because this sort of, one of the things that I always get asked when I give talks about the Turing Way is I get I get asked if I'm worried about boiling the ocean. And I say, no, not really. <laughs> let's, let's go ahead. Let's do How it. do you mean boiling the ocean? Boiling the ocean, meaning that we're trying to do so many things that we're sort of spread too thin and, and trying to, you know, instead of doing one specific task. Eating the whole buffet. Eat the, whole, eat the whole buffet. Exactly, exactly. And I always sort of responded, and again, I to be very clear, would not this is not my answer for all projects. It's just my answer for the Turing Way because I am so excited about sort of the journey and the and the process and the kind of engagement around it. So I think the the sort of question of where where are we going? And what we have, what we haven't really talked about is the expansion. So we originally started as a book just on reproducibility. Um, and then we, we had a second phase of funding and we expanded it. And the reason we expanded it is because, you know, the technical aspects for version control, for testing, for, um, you know, uh, computational environments using containers, for example, they are, they are just a, a small slice of the training that people need in order to actually sort of change the research culture. And so when we expanded the book, we expanded from just focusing on reproducibility to having a guide on reproducibility, one on um, project design. So thinking at the beginning, what's going to be needed, a guide for ethics, a guide for communication, and lots of different broad sort of definitions of communication. Um, and a guide for collaboration. And then there's also another book that's part of it, which is the, the community handbook and our processes. And what I, I don't know if it's a super spicy take, but it's the one that I want to sort of bring up and kind of leave people with is I would love for more people to really see the way that I see how interconnected all of those things are. And just truly, truly how difficult it is to actually compartmentalize any particular task um, or sort of chapter or topic into those five areas. And where I would love for us to sort of, as a community to take the, the book forwards, and we do have a little bit of work that we'll be starting soon around this, is exploring the sort of like a multi-dimensionality of the book. So when you come in at one, you, you've come in because you care about collaboration, but it's taken you to go and find out about project design. Almost every page will at some point take you to some aspect of ethics. If you're not thinking about ethics, if you're not thinking about sort of diverse inclusion, whose voices are not in the room, then those chapters on version control testing, they're not important. And so that's something that I'm really, really excited about with the sort of potential of having of the book being online and being done in the 21st century that we could really sort of give people a choose your own adventure journey through all of those different topics and see how interconnected they are. Love that and uh, the idea of sort of visually uh, and also kind of uh, experientially understanding that nothing happens by itself. You know, you can't just care, or if you I mean you can, but there's a whole more compassionate and like intersectional way that you can understand everything that you're working on. Valvika, how about you? What's your hot, spicy, not so spicy take? I um, I totally agree with Kirsty. I think interconnection, what she pulled, I would like to also think about interconnection in the community aspect. I always define community in scientific uh, area as community as we experience in our daily lives where we are connecting with our neighbors we are exchanging 
tools when we need it, or we are giving each other resources that we have that we are very, very happy about. Um, and we want to bring that element into the community that we are build, building. So it's not just about the Turing way as it exists. We are around and surrounded by loads of incredible communities, a lot of which we try to bring up in our conversation today, that we are connected, connected with each other. Let's see what we need, uh, they need, how can we exchange resources? How can we highlight people from other communities in the work that they are doing? We have this massive platform um, and how can we actually use it in a way that is benefiting the open science ecosystem as large or data science as large and not just the Turing way. So I would always remind you that the Turing way is a platform. It's a community. Uh, it's definitely a book, but it's a book built by the community. So it is for you. Uh, this is something that took me six months to recognize that, yeah, you know, what I'm promoting isn't the project that is mine. It's a project that is people's. I'm just making it discoverable for them. So I'm thinking about interconnection from that perspective is how can we interconnect your community with the Turing Way community? How can we build pathway for people to slide between the communities that they are part of? I think that's a wonderful point to end it. It's, it's, uh, it's a project for you and um personally i have jumped into the turing way early on and i look at it occasionally when i know i need to find a reference and that's my first point of call and but now actually yeah it it, it does feel like it it's been a massive journey for me i've had my own turing way and i unashamedly uh, as i said point people back to the learnings that i've, I've gained from working with both of you and so I think it's we're just going to continue to build this team of people who have these things on their radar, you know, bringing ethics into the conversations early, bringing project management. And I'm so relieved that you don't just have to be an amazing programmer, because even the amazing programmers weren't thinking through all this stuff through. So I'm going to stop there one minute over, which is almost on time for me. So thank you so much, um, both of you, Kirsty and Malvika, for the invitation to come and chat to you. It has been I have missed a glass of wine, but it is only two o'clock, three o'clock on a Friday, so it might have been inappropriate. And thank you all so much for your um, participation in the chat and on the on the doc. And um, I think the document's going to be available for a little while longer. I'm sure it'll probably be archived somewhere fantastically because that's the right thing to do. Um, uh, I know that there's going to be another round of cheering way, another fireside chat coming in maybe November or December. I'm sure that there are multiple ways to get in touch. So um, I'm going to leave it up to Mabika to uh, and Kirsty to maybe drop some links in the chat if there's anything that people would like to follow up on. And I think we'll close there. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Let's send some reactions. Here's a clapping hand. Thank you all for having us. And I look forward to meeting you all again another time. Bye-bye. Of course, Kirsty and Malby, you could say bye too as well. You're very well. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you so much, Cass, for this fantastic conversation. This one.